Chapter 10, Post-War Reconstruction and the Keynesian Welfare State, Wartime Planning and the Budget. The policy of the British government in the Second World War drew on the lessons of the first. There was an immediate realization that the demands of war could impose severe economic and political pressures that could only be accommodated by establishing a rigorous system of controls and by enlisting the support of the working class for the war effort. The circumstances were much more propitious than they had been 25 years ago. Administrative and consultative apparatuses had already been developed to implement the limited interventionist measures of the 1930s. The working class had been brought within the Constitution, pursuing its trade union aspirations through an institutionalized system of industrial relations and its political aspirations through the Labor Party. The radical elements in the Labor Party that briefly came to the fore after 1931 had been defeated. The Communist Party was isolated as a result of the Hitler-Stalin Pact. Popular anti-fascism provided a powerful ideological basis for working class commitment to an imperialist war. The main economic constraints faced by the planners were the availability of labor and shipping space, and it was the allocation of these resources that provided the basis of the planning system, which worked primarily through a licensing system rather than direct control. The growing deficit on the balance of trade was met by foreign borrowing and the massive liquidation of British overseas investments. The deficit was with the United States being covered by Lend-Lease. Food subsidies and price and rent controls, soon supplemented by rationing, were enlisted to combat inflation. The Labor Party was brought into the coalition government in May 1940, and labor given key ministries. There were limited welfare improvements, mainly aimed at the old and at children, and there was a considerable expansion in the health service, which was for the first time set on a national footing. On the other hand, the raising of the school leaving age was abandoned, the housing program came to a halt, and the long overdue reform of the system of social insurance was postponed. The principal wartime concessions were not surprisingly to the trade unions. Trade unions were brought into the apparatus of production planning from shop floor to ministerial level. Existing negotiating machine, machinery was frozen and a national arbitration tribunal established to resolve outstanding disputes. The introduction of fair wage clauses, statutory wage determination and restrictions on labor mobility, and the right of dismissal led to a fall in civilian wage rates, more than compensated by increased overtime, a compression of wage differentials, and a considerable growth in the membership of trade unions. As in the First War, the main concessions were admission to the corridors of power and the promise of a new world to be built. The main threat to the war effort, both political and economic, was inflation, and this raised the question of public finance. The lesson initially drawn from the First War was the need to contain inflationary pressure by minimizing borrowing and to keep down the burden of debt by maintaining low interest rates. However, the balance between taxation and borrowing was determined in an entirely ad hoc way. Admittedly, immediately after the outbreak of war, Keynes pointed out the inflationary consequences of excessive borrowing, although his proposals for sharp increases in taxation met with a hostile response. However, continued inflation, the failure of a small war load in March 1940, and the realization following the fall of France that the war would be long and hard fought led to Keynes being brought into the Treasury with the change of government. The 1941 Kingsley Wood budget was the first Keynesian budget. However, the Kingsley, 1941 Kingsley Wood budget was not Keynesian in the sense of using fiscal policy to regulate the market economy for the economy was regulated by the pervasive system of controls. It was Keynesianism, it was Keynesian in the more limited sense, 
of applying Keynesian principles of public finance to the formulation of the budget. The budget was accompanied by the first white paper on national income and expenditure, which integrated the accounts of the public and private sector to estimate the, quote, inflationary gap that had to be covered by increases in taxation. The adoption of Keynesian budgetary principles led to an influx of economists and statisticians into the Treasury, not to take over the role of economic planning, but to develop a more sophisticated system of national accounting on the basis of which to determine budgetary policy. The system of controls and financial planning was largely successful in containing inflationary pressure. The liquidation of foreign assets and foreign borrowing enabled Britain to maintain the flow of essential supplies. The absorption of the labor and trade union leadership into the state apparatus secured their enthusiastic participation in the war effort. The extension of such assimilation to the shop floor level ensured that the energy of the shop stewards organization was largely directed towards rather than against the war effort. Although there was some industrial unrest, particularly in the mines, there were no signs of the potentially revolutionary outburst that had threatened the fabric of the state during the First World War. Planning for post-war reconstruction. The question of post-war reconstruction was addressed at an early stage in the war. In general, there was a remarkable degree of political consensus over the framework for post-war reconstruction. There were three interrelated priorities underlying the reconstruction plans. Firstly, to secure the foundation for the sustained growth of income and employment by opening up export markets and rebuilding the international monetary system. Secondly, to secure the foundations for the growth of national efficiency, the better to withstand the expected onslaught of foreign, primarily U.S. competition, particularly through the promotion of investment, education, and scientific research. Thirdly, to secure the foundations for political stability by developing a comprehensive system of social security. Political differences were more a matter of emphasis than of principle. The Labor Party, despite its commitment to an extension of nationalization and planning, remained wedded to the view that capitalism was best run by capitalists, while the trade unions were committed to retaining their autonomy. The primary emphasis of labor's plans, therefore, was not on the socialization of production, but on the reform and extension of the welfare system as a means of alleviating poverty, improving national efficiency, and staving off recession by boosting consumption. The framework for post-war planning was laid out in a series of white papers published in 1944 covering social insurance, health, and employment, and in the 1944 Education Act, each of which expressed a broad political consensus. The system of social insurance had been due for reform, having developed in an ad hoc way in response to conflicting pressures. In the interwar period, various schemes had been introduced to keep the unemployed out of the clutches of the poor law, which had become gradually less punitive in response to working class pressure before the, the poor law was finally abolished in 1937, but despite endless commissions and revisions, the insurance system remained incoherent, administratively inefficient, and actu actuarially unsound. Actuarially. Never heard that word before. Provision appeared arbitrary and unfair, which, with provision's punitive elements, provoked considerable popular hostility. The basis for reform was the 1942 Beveridge Report, which laid down six principles. First, it should be comprehensive, including provision should be comprehensive, including health care and the provision of family allowances family allowances long opposed by the TUC as a subsidy to low wages. Second, provision should be have a unified administration. Third, contributions and benefits should be clearly laid down according to the contributory classes, wage earners, the self-employed, housewives, others of working age, the young and the old. Fourth, the payment of adequate benefits. Fifth, the payment of flat or eight benefits, 
according only to family size. Sixth, flat rate contributions, of which 50% would be paid by the state, 30% by the insured, and 28% by employers. Although this would imply an increase in cost of about two-thirds, if unemployment could be controlled, the initial cost of the proposals was kept down by deferring the payment of the full old age pension. The comprehensive coverage of the system and the regressive forms of taxation and contributions that would finance it meant that the scheme would have little redistributive impact. The beverage scheme rationalized and generalized existing provision. Although the beverage scheme's greater coverage and the anticipated higher rates of benefit increased the cost of the system, the beverage scheme did not alter the fundamental principles of social administration. Health care and old age pensions were provided universally, but the beverage scheme was still an insurance scheme, rights being earned by insurance contributions or family dependents. So the scheme was still based on and reinforced the subordination of the worker to the wage form and the subordination of women to the family form. Unemploy unemployment benefit was intended in association with the network of labor exchanges to facilitate the restructuring of capital by lubricating the labor market, not to provide a guaranteed right to subsistence. Thus, the National Assistance Board could provide for those unable to earn a minimum subsistence through wage labor, insurance contributions, or female dependents, while a modified workhouse test continued to be applied to the able-bodied poor in the form of a means test and a judgment of willingness to work. The Treasury was strongly opposed to Bev Beveridge's scheme, primarily on grounds of cost. The Treasury was not sufficiently Keynesian to share Beveridge's belief that the Treasury's contribution to the maintenance of demand would prevent the post-war slump which many feared, so that it would effectively pay for itself, while the, quote, socialization of consumption, end quote, would offer a liberal alternative to the socialization of production. However, the report, the beverage report, was, not, was met with widespread popular enthusiasm. Many employers at least tacitly supported a scheme which they hoped would improve national efficiency and secure social peace at relatively small cost to themselves, and Churchill reversed his initial opposition and came to regard acceptance of Beveridge's scheme as crucial to maintaining working-class morale. Thus, the 1944 White Papers on Health and Social Insurance largely accepted Beveridge's proposals, although they reduced the scale of benefits. The 1944 Education Act similarly extended free secondary education to all, largely on the grounds of national efficiency. The viability of a comprehensive system of social insurance, with the associated safety net of a reformed poor law, depended on the achievement of a reasonably high level of employment to preserve the financial soundness of the scheme. Beveridge's original plan was actuarially based on the assumption of a rate of unemployment no higher than 10% on the interwar definition. The maintenance of a high and stable level of employment was accepted as a political priority in the 1944 Employment White Paper, although this commitment was severely circumscribed the achievement of full, the achievement of full employment depending on the international reconstruction of export markets the achievement of competitiveness wage and price stability and labor mobility although contracyclical public works were envisaged as a stabilization measure the white paper rejected deficit financing in favor of a budget balance over the cycle keynes himself shared the view of the committee that the post-war priority was the expansion of exports, and from 1941 threw himself into the task of rebuilding the international monetary system, which culminated in the establishment of the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development at Bretton Woods in 1944. Parallel negotiations to secure the post-war liberalization of trade culminated in the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 1947, while the political framework for international reconstruction was to be provided by the United Nations and associated agencies, some of which had survived from the days of the League of Nations. 
planning for a new international order. The collapse of the international economic order had led to two devastating world wars. The reconstruction of the international economic order was the first priority of the Western allies when the anticipated victory came. However, such a reconstruction was not simply an economic but also a deeply political question. The German attempt to build the Thousand Year Reich on the basis of its political and military dominance was matched by the attempt of the United States to achieve the liberal millennium on the basis of its economic dominance. Neither project was politically realistic. While military defeat put paid to the former, the contradiction between the nationalist and internationalist aspirations of the United States state <laughs> undermined the latter. The barrier of the national state form could only be overcome by constructing a new international order. The U.S. did not share Britain's view of the war as exclusively an anti-fascist war. For the United States, the war had arisen as a struggle between declining political imperialisms. International reconstruction required the dismantling of both the German and the British Empire and the subordination of nation-states to the power of world money, which in the immediate post-war context meant the dollar. However, Britain was not going to let go of its imperialist obligations easily. Britain constantly resisted U.S. attempts to open the world market to U.S. capital by breaking down the barriers of protectionism and discrimination, arguing that such a scheme could only lead to a post-war resurgence of nationalism, corporatism, and socialism as national governments sought to stabilize their position in the face of the American onslaught. Keynes initially proposed a scheme of international reconstruction based on the extension of the benefits of the Sterling era, area and imperial preference to Europe, a liberal version of the new economic order that the Germans were proposing for Europe. Such a scheme could hardly be expected to appeal to the Americans. The Atlantic Charter of 1941 contracted, extracted a paper commitment from Britain to collaborate in the construction of a multilateral order as the Americans made Lend-Lease conditional on the post-war dismantling of, quote, discrimination, in exchange for which the U.S. committed itself to domestic expansionism. The first priority was international monetary reconstruction. The IMF was designed to overcome the limitations of the gold standard by expanding international liquidity on the basis of the stabilization of exchange rates and the pooling of reserves. In the immediate post-war period, it was clear that the IMF would primarily serve as a source of dollars to the rest of the world, although the free flow of dollars through the IMF would remove the barriers to accumulation in the U.S. by removing the barriers to the accumulation of capital on a world scale. It also implied that the power of the dollar would be placed in the hands of an international agency in which the power of the United States would be wielded by the U.S. Treasury. Although Roosevelt was sympathetic to such an international new deal, which would be expected to benefit the United States working class, the political implications were unacceptable to Congress on populist and nationalistic grounds. However, despite some isolationist sentiment, the issue is not so much one of nationalism versus internationalism, for there was a widespread determination to overcome the nationalism that had destroyed the pre-war economic order and ended in war, while the U.S. urgently needed access to world markets to mobilize its surplus capital and avoid a post-war recession. The issue is rather the form of internationalism, in particular the, the relationship between the international economic and the issue is rather the form of internationalism, and in particular the, in, the relationship between the international economic and international political order which had domestic implications for the relation between the power of money and the power of the state. For Morgenthau and his colleagues in the U.S. Treasury, the international economic order should be subject to political regulation within a framework of international political cooperation
based on the democratization of the occupied powers and building on the wartime alliance, including the Soviet Union. On the other hand, the Eastern bankers vigorously pressed the key currency strategy of international reconstruction on the basis of the Wall Street-London axis, with sterling restored, subordinated to the dollar, by a large reconstruction loan within a multilateralist economic order dominated by the global power of the dollar. This perspective was shared by those in the State Department who saw the basis for international political reconstruction not in a political internationalism, but in a U.S.-dominated Atlantic alliance. Although the U.S. Treasury was politically isolated, it retained considerable influence until Roosevelt's death, and it was not until 1947-8 that liberal Atlanticism finally triumphed over progressive internationalism with the adoption of the Marshall Plan, the formation of NATO, and the confrontation with the Soviet Union over Berlin. The anticipated final role of Sterling and the pol and political role of Britain meant that the Atlanticist position was not unacceptable to the city of London or to the British government. However, Britain had no intention of accepting political subordination to the United States or economic subordination to the dollar. Thus, the British strategy that evolved was one of exploiting the contradictions in the United States position to build a role for an independent British imperialism on the basis of the empire and the sterling area with a view to constructing an Atlantic alliance of equal partnership. The Atlanticist perspective prevailed in the compromise reached in the IMF negotiations. The U.S. insisted on limiting the quota contributions to be made to the fund and similarly limited the resources available for long-term lending to the World Bank. The limitation on the resources available to the fund was compensated by the obligation imposed on surplus and deficit countries alike to rectify persistent payment imbalances, an obligation that had been negated under the gold standard by the sterilization of gold reserves by the surplus countries, and that was to be honored more in the breach than in the observance under the IMF regime. The scarce, the quote, scarce currency clause, end quote, added a British insistence which permitted retaliatory measures against countries in persistent surplus, was a weak substitute for Keynes' proposal to impose an escalating scale of penalty charges on surplus countries. Apart from this clause, the article of the fund prohibited discrimina discrimination and envisaged a gradual return to full convertibility. Exchange rate variations were permitted only to correct, quote, fundamental disequilibrium, end quote. The limited resources available to the IMF meant that it would only be able to finance small payment deficits. Although some controls on capital movements were permitted, the commitment to free convertibility, fixed exchange rates, and non-discrimination implied the finance, that the financing of persistent imbalances could only be provided bilaterally, outside the IMF framework, the only source of such finance in the post-war world being the United States. Thus, while it expanded international liquidity, the International Monetary Fund did not overcome the limitations of the gold standard, and the international economic system was once more vulnerable to the vagaries of U.S. policy, while the new power of the dollar gave the United States a potential stranglehold on the reconstruction of the international economic and political system. The Reconstruction of Anglo-American Imperialism The framework for post-war economic reconstruction had already been laid down before the 1945 election by the international agreements which committed Britain to the reconstruction of the liberal world order based on trade and monetary liberalization. The domestic commitments to full employment and to the construction of a comprehensive welfare system were backed by no such international guarantees. Although popular enthusiasm ensured a landslide of labor victory in 1945, its promises would be worth no more than had been those of Lloyd George in 1918 if it could not prove itself more successful in the task of economic reconstruction. While Britain's international agreements specifically endorsed the right of the government to pursue 
domestic, social, and political policies of its own choosing, the commitment to trade and monetary liberalization implied the dismantling of the apparatus of wartime control, while the need to secure dollar loans to finance reconstruction gave the United States enormous political leverage. Although there were elements in the United States who sought in the emerging Cold War atmosphere to use this leverage to block the dangerously socialist plans of the labor government, the application of such pressure could hardly coexist with the commitment to democracy that was the ideological basis on which the war had been fought and on which the resistance to the communist threat was founded. Meanwhile, the labor government showed no inclination to renege on its international obligations by extending the system of wartime controls to put into practice its long-standing commitment to socialist planning, a strategy that would have, had, have met only with concerted U.S. opposition, but also the obstruction from civil service and capital alike. Nevertheless, such a strategy might prove unavoidable if Reconstruction on the basis of Britain's international commitments failed, a danger that ensured that the Labour government retained the grudging support of those domestic and foreign forces that had reserved se severe reservations about its welfare policies. The liquidation of British overseas investments, the sudden termination of Lend-Lease at the end of the war, the accumulation of sterling balance and the heavy impact of demands of reconstruction meant that the economic priority was to build up exports by recovering old markets and conquering new markets. The scale of the task was enormous, for many markets had been lost in the course of the war, while the anticipated deficit called for an increase to at least 175% of the pre-war level of exports, with a large increase in dollar exports to finance the demands of Britain and the sterling area for U.S. imports. The need to expand exports had two dimensions. On the one hand, the physical need to expand production and export and import substituting industries. This priority dominated domestic economic planning and preoccupied labor ministers. On the other hand, the need to strengthen the balance of international payments in order to reduce the dependence of sterling on the dollar and lay the foundations for the reconstruction of British imperialism within the framework of an equal partnership in the Atlantic Alliance. The Atlantic Alliance was clearly of interest to the City of London, but it was also of wider concern, for unless the international standing of sterling could be restored so that sterling could serve as the means of international payment, trade and production would continue to be restricted by the availability of gold and dollars. This priority dominated the reconstruction of British international economic and political relationships, the economic aspirations of which were affected primarily by civil servants and bankers, with little reference to ministers who neither understood nor had much interest in what they were doing, while the political aspects were dominated by the development of the Anglo-U.S. military cooperation. Nevertheless, the Labour government had no reservations about a strategy which gave free vent to its virulent anti-communism and its historical commitment to British imperialism, tempered only by its identification with the cause of Indian nationalism and a concern for the development of the colonies that was motivated more by the need for dollar saving and dollar earning than any concern for the destitution of the colonial populations. The first priority of the new government was to secure a large U.S. loan. However, the United States government was not prepared to provide a loan that would simply shore up British imperialism or create the space within which the government could give free rein to any socialist aspirations and so demanded that the multilateralist provisions of Bretton Woods should be honored by dismant the dismantling of discriminatory trading policy practices discriminatory trading practices, and the restoration of the full convertibility of sterling within one year of granting the loan, a demand that the labor left resisted, but that Britain had no choice but to accept, at least on paper, even though Britain's adverse trading and financial position made such a prospect quite unrealistic. Although Britain accepted the terms although Britain accepted the terms of the U.S. loan, it had no intention of putting those terms into effect. The result was that alongside the paper commitment to multilateralism, 
the British government immediately sought to secure its position by negotiating bilateral agreements with its trading and monetary partners, a strategy anticipated in Keynes' original plan of 1941 that envisaged extending imperial preference and the sterling area to Europe, although convertibility was restored as agreed in 1947, the drain on the reserves meant that it had to be suspended almost immediately, and Britain did virtually nothing to implement the non-discrimination terms of its solemn agreements with the United States. The failure of British convertibility in 1947 sealed the fate of the key currency strategy of Britain as thre- Brit- uh, the failure of British convertibility in 1947 sealed the fate of the key currency strategy as Britain threatened to go its own way in extending the sterling area through bilateral negotiations rather than dismantling it on the basis of dollar convertibility. The underlying problem facing the United States was that its multilateralist ambitions could never be reconciled with its attempt to use the power of the dollar as a political weapon. The issue came to a head with a looming political crisis in Europe which urgently demanded direct military, political, and economic action, opening the way to an alternative internationalist strategy based on the direct intervention of the United States in the economic and political reconstruction of Europe. Martial Aid and the Rebuilding of Europe Martial Aid and the Rebuilding of Europe By 1947, it was clear that the U.S. policy of retribution against the defeated powers was undermining the attempt to establish political stability by exporting the U.S. model of trade unionism and the principles of the New Deal as bulwarks of democracy, and was merely playing into the Russians' hands by shifting the balance of class forces in favor of the working class in the occupied countries. Sorry, I need to repeat that. By 1947, it was clear that the U.S. policy of retribution against the defeated powers was undermining the attempt to establish political stability. By exporting the U.S. model of trade unionism and the principles of the New Deal as bulwarks of democracy, and was merely playing into the Russians' hands by shifting the balance of class forces in favor of the working class in the occupied countries. The failure to solve the problem of the dollar shortage was primarily playing into the hands of the left in Western Europe by undermining the attempt at monetary stabilization and economic reconstruction, while the attempt to work through Britain was being thwarted by Britain's own imperialist ambitions. The British withdrawal from Greece in order to concentrate its military forces on maintaining the empire finally made it clear that the fate of Europe was in the hands of the United States. The basis of the new strategy of rebuilding Western Europe, centered on Germany as a bulwark against communism, was the integration of Western Europe into an Atlantic economy, in which economic interdependence would provide a firm basis for the Atlanticist political alliance. This could not be done by using the dollar to subordinate Western Europe to narrow U.S. interests, but only by an internationalist program of economic and political reconstruction. The starting point was the German currency reform, vigorously opposed by the Soviet Union, which precipitated the division of Germany as joint allied control broke down and culminated in the Berlin blockade. The solution to the problem of the dollar gap was Marshall Aid, a free gift of $13 billion to finance reconstruction and currency stabilization, which had the added merit of staving off the looming U.S. recession by expanding U.S. exports. The program had the long-term cosmopolitan objective of stimulating a flow of U.S. private investment to Europe to secure the integration of Europe into an Atlantic economy and to raise European productivity levels to overcome the uneven development of the forces of production that was the primary barrier to the recovery of accumulation on a world scale. However, Marshall Aid was far more than an economic program. Martial aid was the linchpin of a strategy to secure the social and political reconstruction of Europe on the American model. By providing the expansionary economic environment 
in which to foster collaborative industrial relations and American mass production methods while launching a political offensive against the left in the trade unions and sponsoring right-wing political regimes. Footnote. Thus it, was, it would be more accurate to describe the post-war regime of accumulation as, quote, Marshallism than, quote, Keynesianism or, quote, Fordism, which strictly describe only elements of the strategy. End of footnote. Unlike the Dawes plan, Marshall aid envisaged the reconstruction of Europe on a regional rather than a national basis, hoping to ensure that Marshall aid did not allow the latitude to national governments, which had permitted the interwar resurgence of German and British imperialism, and that now threatened to drive Europe into the hands of communism. Thus, Marshall aid was aimed primarily at fostering the integration of the Western European economy and its insulation from that of the East, making a mockery of the claim that Marshall was offered to Soviet Union on an equal basis. European integration would similarly undercut the British system of imperial preference. The proponents of an international, the proponents of an international New Deal based on the wartime alliance found themselves in full retreat, denounced as agents of international communism. The Soviet Union was successfully isolated in the United Nations, while new international organizations were established to give political form to the new internationalism, notably NATO and the OEEC, through which martial aid was channeled. However, the hope that European integration would undercut the British system of imperial preference and bypass Sterling was over-optimistic. The weak link in the plan was the failure of the Marshall Program to solve the problem of the international monetary system, the hope that the problem of intra-European settlements could be solved by establishing the free convertibility of European currencies was naive, for most European governments were not prepared to allow their neighbors free access to their reserves of scarce U.S. dollars. This weakness in the program left a gap, which Britain could once more exploit to Britain's own advantage, forging a temporary alliance with France, which had unhappy memories of the previous U.S. attempt to rebuild Germany. Britain was quite willing to participate in the coordination of policy in Western Europe, and was more than willing to accept dollar aid, provided that such participation did not comp compromise Britain's wider imperialist role based on the sterling area, through which Britain secured privileged access to export markets and cheap food and raw materials. Britain took a lead in sponsoring trade liberalization to open the European market to its exports, but only to head off more radical proposals, while its domination of the OEC ensured that the organization was denied any supranational powers acting only as the coordinating agency for the independent policies of national governments. Britain similarly sought to subvert the U.S. attempt to impose a multilateral payment system on Europe by resisting the United States' demand for the free transferability of martial dollars, intra-European settlements still being primarily on a bilateral basis. The 1949 Sterling Crisis led to a re-evaluation of the British strategy, confirming Britain's commitment to the empire. The, the crisis was partly precipitated by the impact of the U.S. recession, from which continental Europe was largely insulated, on the exports of the sterling area, drawing attention once more to the dependence of Britain on the dollar earnings of the sterling area. On the other hand, Western European trade was predominantly intra-European, while Br the British share of such trade was declining and the payments arrangements associated with the Marshall Plan offered little prospect of Britain gaining from increased European dollar earnings. The result was to confirm Britain's long-term strategy of establishing a relationship with the dollar on the basis of the strength of the sterling area, the culmination of the strategy being the restoration of dollar convertibility. The sharp devaluation of the pound in 1949 and controls on dollar imports strengthened sterling, and Britain's bargaining position with the United States, and laid the foundations on which this strategy could be pursued to fruition. The strengthening of sterling also changed the British approach to what became the European Payments Union. The free transferability of reserves 
combined with the need to maintain European restrictions on dollar convertibility, provided an opening for sterling to establish itself as the dominant European currency, provided only that Britain could establish a prevailing stat privilege status for sterling within the Union. However, unilateral British devaluation and Britain's bilateral negotiations with the United States aroused deep European suspicions. The U.S. threat to establish the EPU without Britain persuaded the British government to join on the basis of guarantees that the EPU claim made, that made the U.S. threat to establish the EPU without Britain persuaded the British government to join on the basis of guarantees that made EPU claims freely convertible into sterling, while limiting the convertibility of sterling into EPUs. Although sterling did benefit from participation in the EPU, the easing of the European dollar shortage meant that sterling was not able to establish its supremacy over the other European currencies, while growing intra-European trade and Britain's continued commitment to the empire strengthened the basis for a European integration that would exclude Britain. Thus Britain remained aloof from the Schuman Plan to integrate the European coal and steel industries and to keep out of the ECSC set up to implement it, out of which the EEC eventually emerged. Marshall aid had still not solved the problem of the dollar gap, while the anticipated flow of U.S. investment to Europe had not materialized. The EPU provided a framework within which intra-European trade could grow rapidly, but the shortage of dollars still held back U.S. exports to Europe, and so both the U.S. leverage over European reconstruction and domestic accumulation in the United States. The solution proposed by the State Department was rearmament, which was justified by the supposed threat of an imminent Soviet invasion of Western Europe and the emergence of the Chinese peril, which was defended in pure Keynesian terms as a costless form of expenditure. As the multiplier effect of increased expenditure increased, the national product, and so the means to pay for it. Increased U.S. military expenditure in Europe would emphasize more forcefully than had the Marshall Program the dependence of European reconstruction on the United States, while helping to fill the dollar gap both directly and increasing the confidence of U.S. investors in the security of Western Europe. The Korean War provided the opportunity to implement this program. At the same time, enthusiastic participation in the war and the rearmament drive provided the Labour government with the opportunity to prove that it had established Britain's full independence and maturity as a world power that could stand shoulder to shoulder, etc. Planning and the Budget Despite its rhetoric and the rearguard action of the left, the Labour government was committed from its inception to a strategy based not on planning, but on the reconstruction of the liberal state form within the framework of a resurgent British imperialism. The dollar loan and the growing strength of sterling provided a framework within which the government could address the problem of exports and import saving, which was its immediate domestic priority. Although the strategy envisaged the dismantling of wartime controls, there was no question of doing so immediately, for fear of unleashing an inflationary boom and crash, such as had followed the end of the First War. However, the system of controls could hardly be called an apparatus of planning, for the government had no direct control over production. During the war, the government could control the growth of the military industries because it was their only customer but it had no such power over peacetime industry. Thus, controls primarily took the negative form of the rationing of consumer goods and the licensing of investment. Raw material supplies and imports, although agriculture and investment were encouraged by subsidies, grants, and tax relief, which were initially used to direct industry to the development areas. Nationalization primarily affected industries that were already in public ownership, or under direct state control, although it was extended to the mines, iron, 
mines, railways, iron, and steel, and the health service, the main motive being the rationalization of the industries in question rather than to assist overall planning, let alone to establish democratic control. Even a central economic planning staff was not established until 1947. In the absence of any administrative apparatus to oversee the comprehensive planning of reconstruction, positive measures were largely limited to exhortation through the development councils that had emerged from the wartime tripartite working parties for particular industries. The main task of Reconstruction was to rebuild the export and related capital goods industries while damping down domestic and import demand through taxation, rationing, licensing, and subsidization of agriculture and the restriction of house building. There was no problem in selling goods abroad, for the economic dislocation of Europe and the dollar shortage meant that the world market was wide open, although penetrating the U.S. market was more difficult. Thus, the export industries responded to the opportunities that confronted them to achieve a spectacular increase in production and exports. The most dramatic growth was in the new industries, led by motor vehicles, aviation, and electronics, which had grown up in response to the more sophisticated demands of modern war, but even the traditional industries held their own. Improvements in productivity, already well below U.S. levels, were not so dramatic. Although overall manufacturing productivity increased considerably, much of the improvement was due to the scrapping of archaic plant. Some of the new industries achieved high levels of productivity using up-to-date plant and modern management, but few even approached U.S. standards. This was hard, partly because the dollar shortage limited imports of the most advanced machinery, but it was also because the success of manufacturers in increasing their exports in soft markets, where manufacturers face little or no competition, removed any incentive to introduce the most advanced methods of production and management or to dismantle the apparatus of shop floor power that was a legacy of wartime collaboration. Indeed, while production was the bottleneck, employers were often only too glad to concede control over manning levels and job demarcations to the shop floor in exchange for industrial peace and increased production, particularly where management had little knowledge or understanding of the complexities of the production process. The main threat to labor's commitment to full employment continued to be the shortage of dollars to buy essential food and means of production. Although exports soared, the demand for imports also increased rapidly. The only way of preventing such a situation from weakening sterling and halting recovery was to retain strict controls on imports, a policy which proved successful to the extent that the government weathered successive sterling crises by tightening controls without having to resort to deflationary policies. Thus, apart from the 1947 fuel crisis, unemployment never rose as high as even the optimist target of 3%. By 1949, British exporters were beginning to face increasing competition in world markets as the European recovery got underway and the dollar shortage began to ease. The sterling crisis threatened to curb the recovery, but tightening controls cut dollar imports and the devaluation of sterling increased the competitiveness, competitiveness of British exports and ensured that the growth in both volume and value was maintained, although also increased inflationary pressure. While full employment was maintained by the success of export dr drive and controls on imports, the main feature of the government was not rising. The main, while full employment was maintained by the success of the export drive and controls on imports, the main fear of the government was not rising unemployment, but inflation. With the memory of the post World War I experience of an inflationary boom followed by a slump always in mind. Thus, the government had no clear target for the level of unemployment until Gateskell defined a target rate of 3% in 1951, the government's budgetary policies being dictated by the strength of inflationary fears. The government maintained the wartime policy of cheap money, which ruled out the use of an active monetary policy to curb inflation, so the government continued to use the wartime expedience of controls and fiscal adjustments. Although the commitment to full employment branded the government as Keynesian, 
in the eyes of history. It was some time before the government's budgetary policy was formulated according to Keynesian principles. With the death of Keynes, the Treasury lost its only professional economist, while the economic section of the cabinet had no departmental responsibility. Although the cabinet included several economists, none of the leading members were fully fledged Keynesians until Gateskill became chancellor in the dying days of the Labour government. Thus, Dalton's early budgets were formulated on the basis of, quote, the manpower gap, end quote, rather than Keynesian, quote, inflationary gap, end quote. And according to the principle of balancing the budget over the cycle, rather than applying Keynesian budgetary principles, while inflation was primarily checked by direct controls and food subsidies. Nevertheless, successive crises from 1947 forced the government to have greater regard to the inflationary pressures created by high levels of demand. Even when fiscal adjustments came to play a greater role in the control of inflation, they tended to be ad hoc crisis measures rather than being instruments of systematic Keynesian demand management. The failure to adopt systematic Keynesian policies and the retention of controls reflected the pressures to which the various chancellors were subject. The first priority was neither full employment nor price stability, but the production drive. It was only when inflationary pressures threatened to undermine the production drive that the government acted to contain inflationary pressures. And in such circumstances, price stability took priority over full employment. Thus, Cripps sought to relieve inflationary pressure in 1948 by constraining the building industry, anticipating a 50% increase in unemployment. Thus, Cripps sought to relieve inflationary pressure in 1948 by constraining the building industry, anticipating a 50% increase in unemployment. The inflationary bias was reinforced by pressures to maintain government expenditure in support of the production drive, and towards the end of the government's term, to meet the escalating demands of the health service and rearmament, and by the fear that further increases in taxation would prove politically unacceptable, and by eroding savings counterproductive. These pressures combined to make successive chancellors reluctant to relieve inflationary pressure by budgetary means, preferring to make patriotic appeals to the public to save. The result was that the residual burden fell on direct controls. Food subsidies, rationing, and price controls kept the prices of essential goods in check, and shortages probably encouraged saving, but at the cost of increasing taxation, a growing black market, and increasing the price of uncontrolled goods, which threatened to divert supplies from export to the domestic market. The unpopularity of controls with the government as well as with the public and the civil service led to the controls dismantling as soon as the easing of the financial pressures made it possible to do so without undermining the external position, although they had to be tightened and reimposed in successive crises. Consumer prices rose by around a quarter over the labor government's first term, part of which can be explained by rising world prices but which also reflected the very low level of unemployment. Labor shortages in the expanding sectors meant that employers willingly conceded higher wages. The continued growth of trade union membership, the strength of trade union organization, the removal of some of the legal disabilities of trade unions, and the extension of the wage council system meant that workers elsewhere were well placed to pressure for increase. Uh, the continued growth of trade union membership, the strength of trade union organization, the removal of some of the legal disabilities of trade unions, and the extension of the wage council system meant that workers elsewhere were well placed to press for increases in money wages to compensate for inflation. The danger was that if workers were successful in this result, in this, the result would be an inflationary spiral. Until 1948, the government relied on its support among the trade union leadership and patriotic exhortations to persuade the trade unions to restrain their wage demands, strikes being restrained by the retention of the wartime apparatus of compulsory arbitration. However, as inflation persisted, the government secured the formal agreement 
of the TUC to a policy of wage restraint in exchange for a freeze on rents and profits, wage increases to be justified only on the grounds of increased productivity or labor shortages in strategic sectors. Although the TUC added low wages and the maintenance of differentials as grounds for in wage increases, which in theory undermined the policy and abandoned its commitment to wage restraint in 1950, in practice the trade union leadership did contain pressure for wage increases, so that after 1946 real wage rates fell steadily. On the other hand, the collaboration of unions in wage restraint and the constraints on official strikes imposed by compulsory arbitration led to a further growth in the strength of unofficial shop floor organization and an increase in unofficial strikes. The Legacy of Labor The successful reintegration of Britain into the world economy on the basis of the empire and the sterling area laid the foundations for a dramatic recovery, permitting the maintenance of high levels of employment and the implementation of the government's welfare program. The very low rate of unemployment and low rates of benefit, further averted by inflation, kept the cost of the welfare program down, although expenditure on the health service increased far more than had been anticipated. The universalism of the system combined with the regressive impact of flat rate contributions and heavy indirect taxation, meant that it involved very limited redistribution of income, the cost of relieved primary poverty. The universalism of the system, combined with the regressive impact of flat rate contributions and heavy indirect taxation, meant that it involved very limited redistribution of income, the cost of relieving primary poverty falling on the employed working class. Nevertheless, full employment and a comprehensive system of health and social security transformed the condition of the working class by relieving it from fear, if not of poverty, at least of starvation. Moreover, low unemployment, the universalism of family allowances, and rates of benefit, considerably below the lowest industrial wages, made it possible to respond to working class aspirations by reducing the punitive elements of the old system without fear of eroding the discipline of the wage form. Social security gradually lost its charitable connotations and a minimum level of health, education, and subsistence came to be seen as a right of all citizens, earned through the hardship of war and post-war austerity. On the other hand, this also implied that the system of relief had lost much of its power as a moralizing and disciplining force. This did not mean that the state ceased to concern itself with such matters, but rather that the burden was shifted to different state agencies, education, the courts, the police, the system of industrial relations, and the rapid growth of, quote, social work that developed out of the Victorian Edwardi and Edwardian institutions of charitable and public health visiting. Although there was a substantial increase in the national income, the bulk of that increase was absorbed by the deterioration in terms of trade, much of which was due to devaluation. The export and investment drive and increased government spending, while population growth left little room for improved living standards. The fall in real wage rates was only compensated by increased overtime and the move into higher wage occupations while salaries suffered a sharper fall. Although supplies of the essential means of subsistence increased, restrictions on house building had, to, had led to an enormous backlog of demand and an acute housing shortage. Rampant inflation was only kept in check by the restriction of trade union activity and a pervasive network of controls. By 1950, the Labour government had largely completed the program on which the Labour government had been elected. The Labour government had been remarkably successful in reconstructing British imperialism in consolidating and rationalizing the form of the welfare state. However, the price of the working class had to pay for handing its leadership, handing its leadership the levers of political power was the working class's continued subordination to the alienated forms of the wage and the capitalist state. The labor government had rationalized and extended the welfare system, but only at the cost of the labor government's increasing bureaucratization. 
Uh, the labor government had rationalized and extended the welfare system, but only at the cost of the welfare systems, increasing bureaucratization, health, education, social work, the nationalized industries and national insurance, were all administered by professional civil servants, doctors, teachers, social workers, managers, actuaries, and accountants within bureaucratic hierarchies, regulated by a dense network of administrative, financial, and legal regulation, financed increasingly by central government out of general taxation and insurance contributions, the oppressive agencies of the National Assistance Board, the courts, the police, and the military were even less subject to democratic pressure and democratic control. Even the trade unions were drawn into an uneasy alliance with the capitalist state as the trade unions sought to reconcile their responsibility to their membership with the political imperative of the production drive, leading to a growing gap between the strategy of the leadership and the aspirations of the trade union members expressed in the growing strength of rank-and-file organization. However, Far from building on shop floor trade unionism and a rank and file organization, such as tenants associations, as the basis on which to create new forms of democratic participation, which would confront the power of capital with the power of the organized working class, the government saw such autonomous challenges to the economic and political power of capital as challenges to its own authority. Meanwhile, the means of regulating the production and circulation of use values in accordance with collective needs that had been established in war on the basis of military demand were progressively dismantled as the production drive was subordinated not to popular needs but to the reconstruction of British imperialism and the confinement of the working class within the wage form as the basis on which to restore the domestic and international rule of money. The contradiction was resolved ideologically because the expansion of exports was undoubtedly necessary, not only to secure the expanded reproduction of capital, but also to secure the essential food and means of production that could not be produced domestically, a physical constraint dramatically brought home by the 1947 fuel crisis and more mundanely symbolized by the ration book. Thus the ideological watchword of labor strategy was not Keynes but austerity, not consumption as the spur to production, but production as the limit to consumption. While the construction of the welfare state and the maintenance of full employment was a, re was a source of considerable popular support, the continuation of rationing and controls, the erosion of living standards by inflation, the growing shortage of housing was a source of widespread dissatisfaction with the government's record. Nevertheless, the stabilization of the balance of payments, the moderation of inflation, and the, quote, bonfire of controls, End quote, made it appear that progress was being made on these fronts until the government ran into a new crisis precipitated by the strains of rearmament and the Korean War boom. The Korean War boom in the United States came on top of the pressure set up by the European Reconstruction boom, leading to a massive increase in import prices and sharp deterioration in the balance of payments. The deterioration in the balance of payments and the inflationary pressure of rearmament at home led to increases in taxation, direct controls on credit, cuts in public expenditure, the reimposition of controls on consumption and investment, and an attempt to impose wage restraints to impose wage restraint that was rejected by the TUC, all of which appeared to reverse the gains of the previous years, while divisions within the government made it clear that it had lost its way. Although Labour secured a majority of the popular vote in the 1951 election, with the highest vote it ever recorded, the Conservatives secured a majority of seats and formed a new government. The Conservatives came to power on a program that aimed to contain class conflict by responding to the economic aspirations of the working class, promising to maintain the welfare state, to remove the restrictions on collective bargaining and considerably to expand the housing program and committing the government to maintaining full employment as the government's first priority. Thus, the conservative government proposed not to reverse labor's project but to complete labor's project by dismantling the apparatus of control that successive crises had forced labor to maintain. However, it was not immediately clear how the commitment to full employment could be reconciled with the Conservatives' commitment 
to the orthodox principles of sound money and prudent government as the means of securing price stability, since the program immediately implied increases in money wages and in public expenditure that could only erode profits and lead to increased unemployment, unless they were accommodated by inflation. Thus the question immediately arose is whether the conservatives' primary commitment was to price stability or to full employment. In fact, the conservatives' priority was clear. Price stability was the only secure basis on which to manage the economy and to achieve high levels of employment in the long run. The commitment to full employment was not a commitment to make full employment the immediate policy objective, but an expression of the faith in the ability of the market to achieve full employment on the basis of sound monetary and financial policies. The test of sound policy was the balance of payments. While monetary policy was seen as the most flexible and effective means of responding to fluctuations in the reserves, and the rapid restoration of sterling convertibility was seen as the best means of ensuring that appropriate policies were pursued. In short, it seemed that the conservatives intended to restore the well-worn principles of fiscal rectitude and the gold exchange standard, pursuing an active monetary policy to maintain monetary stability, with Keynesian principles being relegated to their passive wartime role of ensuring the non-inflationary financing of public expenditure. At the first government, at first, the government seemed to be set on this course. The policy of cheap money was abandoned as the government raised bank rate and imposed controls on consumer credit, reinforcing the recession that was already underway. However, the circumstances that had brought about the fall of labor had already passed. Import prices fell sharply, reinforcing the impact of the domestic recession and in curbing inflationary pressures and relieving the balance of payments so that the requirements of monetary and financial stability were no longer inconsistent with those of full employment. Unemployment was soon falling from the post-war peak of 2% in 1952. By 1953, the government was able to reduce both income and tax and bank rate in the first expansionary budget since the war, which added to the reflationary impact of the housing program the post-war boom was underway. Although the boom permitted a sustained rise in wages and public expenditure, the boom was not driven forward by the growth of domestic demand, but by high rates of investment and the rapid growth of exports. The post-war boom was from its inception a world boom with whose foundations had been laid in the period of Reconstruction. The Foundations of the Post-War Boom The post-war boom was initially based on the generalization of, quote, Fordist methods of mass production of consumer goods and the associated steel, power, and machine tool industries. The new forms of Fordist production had been pioneered in the United States in the 1920s and first took root in Europe in the boom of the end of that decade continuing to expand in the depression of the 1930s when, despite high unemployment, living standards of those in work rose as food prices fell. However, the growth of these new industries continued to be restricted by the limited size of the market, while protectionist barriers confined them to the domestic market. The more sophisticated military demands of the Second World War led to an enormous expansion of the new industries, particularly vehicles, aviation, and electronics. In the immediate post-war period, the reconversion of these branches of military production to peacetime conditions was possible in Britain despite the severe restrictions on civilian consumption because the world market lay at Britain's feet, although their growth was limited by supplies of power, steel, and labor. Martial aid and the surge of U.S. investment after the Korean War, soon spread the latest methods of production to continental Europe, with the state playing a central role in the development of the new industries, 
and of the machine tool steel and power supply industries necessary to provide the appropriate means of production. In Japan, the Dodge plan had halted reparations payments, fostering the rapid mon monopolization of capital and the close integration of financial and productive capital with the state, and checked the advance of the labor movement on the basis of a sharply deflationary package, paving the way for capital to take advantage of the stimulus provided by the U.S. military expenditure in the Korean War. Even in the United States, the state was heavily involved in promoting the development of the military sector, which had extensive civilian spin-offs. Britain spent the vast majority of its martial allocation on food, and British employers were very resistant to the attempt to spread American methods. This was partly because the fragmentation of production units meant that British manufacturers did not regard the market as being sufficiently large to justify mass production methods, and the, partly because they felt that attempts to introduce American, quote, time and motion methods would undermine the existing system of industrial relations. For similar reasons, manufacturers and unions alike were unsympathetic to attempts to attract new American investors to set up in Britain. Thus, British industry lagged in the adoption of the most advanced production methods and continued to be marked by a proliferation of producers, competition taking the form of a high degree of product differentiation. The estab this established a vicious circle in which the proliferation of end products presented a barrier to the standardization of parts, and so the development of mass production techniques in the component and machine tool industries, which in turn inhibited the development of such techniques in the production of end products, the monopolization of industry in Europe, the destruction of trade unionism in the war, and the Marshall-inspired Americanization of post-war European industrial relations meant that European capitalists faced new su few such barriers to the adoption of new methods. The Americanization of European industry did not simply involve technique changes. It presupposed and encouraged monopolization to reap the necessary economies of scale and to stabilize production and markets. It required appropriate systems of education and industrial training and financial systems that could channel capital into industrial reconstruction. Moreover, it required the intensification of labor to achieve the high levels of output required to cover the heavy cross costs of fixed investment and a corresponding system of industrial relations that included plant-level bargaining that could accommodate regular changes in production methods and that could maintain continuity of production by avoiding industrial disputes. The workers were reconciled to such a system by being paid relatively high wages. The cooperation of the workers in the constant introduction of new methods of production was secured by the granting of regular wage increases, sometimes directly linked to productivity or profits, while more or less generous unemployment insurance reduced working class resistance to industrial restructuring. The high profits of booming markets meant that the effects of barriers, the effective barrier to accumulation in the reconstruction period was the supply of means of production and subsistence, which appeared to national governments in the form of the dollar shortage. This barrier was overcome by the coordinated state sponsorship of the development of the production of the means of production and subsistence. By currency adjustments, direct controls of international flows of capital and commodities, long-term investment, and the development of the system of international money and credit. The success of this international effort was the basis on which the planning mechanisms of the immediate post-war period could be dismantled and the liberalization of trade and payments could proceed rapidly through the 1950s. Before the Second World War, the growth of the new industries had been restricted by the limited extent of the market. The fear in the Reconstruction period had been that the post-war Reconstruction boom would soon come up against the same barrier, leading to a renewed slump. However, the new system of industrial relations, pioneered in somewhat different forms in the U.S. and Britain in the 1930s, established the relationship between the growth of production and the growth of wages that the planners hoped would overcome the barrier of the market.
increased working class consumption was supplemented by the rapid growth of the middle class associated with the monopolization of industry and the expansion of public administration. Consumer credit widened the market for automobiles, electrical goods, and consumer durables. Large sections of the working class were thus drawn into the market for the new industries. The price the working class paid being a burden of housing and consumer debt that claimed a rising proportion of disposable income and that inhibited workers from taking strike action, so contributing to the stabilization of the system of industrial relations. A substantial increase in the rate of profit saving, primarily to pay for pensions and house purchase, pensions and house purchase provided funds for the expansion of private house construction through building societies and to finance a substantial increase in the rate of productive investment through pension funds and insurance companies without a correspondingly large increase in the rate of profit. Rapid accumulation in manufacturing was accompanied by the more rapid development of capitalist agriculture on a world scale. The autarkic policies of the 1930s and 1940s had already led to considerable increases in agricultural productivity in Europe and to the development of the colonies as sources of food and raw materials, still largely on an extensive basis, making use of plentiful supplies of cheap labor. The wartime development of vehicles and chemicals provided the means of production for the rapid development of capitalist agriculture in the metropolitan countries in the 1950s, spurred on by falling prices as agricultural overproduction flooded world markets, the impact of which was ameliorated by systematic state support for agricultural prices. The same low prices forced third world governments to expand their export agriculture in a desperate race to keep export earnings sufficient to meet essential import requirements. Similarly, the opening up of new reserves of minerals, coal and oil, meant that supplies of fuel and raw materials more than kept pace with the rapidly increasing demand. Welfare Wages in the Working Class the foundations of the post-war boom were laid by pervasive state intervention in the restructuring of the technical, social, monetary, financial, and political framework of capitalist production. Throughout the post-war boom, the state was more or less actively involved in fostering the accumulation of domestic productive capital by promoting national efficiency and international competitiveness by expanding public education, supporting scientific and industrial research, channeling industrial finance, providing fiscal incentives to investment, sponsoring monopolization and industrial rationalization, and in removing barriers to accumulation by providing infrastructural investments, particularly in power, transport, and steel. Nevertheless, the dismantling of the systems of production planning of the war and the reconstruction period, and reconstruction period mm, nevertheless, the dismantling of the systems of production planning of the war and reconstruction period and the rapid liberalization of domestic and industrial markets meant that, however extensive the intervention of the state, the driving force and ultimate limit of accumulation was the profitability of productive investment. Thus, more or less extensive public investment was matched by the rapid liberalization of the regulation of accumulation and the subordination of both capital and the state to the global rule of money expressed in the constraint of profitability on the capitalist enterprise and in the monetary, fiscal, and financial constraints imposed on the state by the need to maintain the stability of the currency and to finance its expenditure within the limits of the liberal state form. The rapid accumulation of capital in the post-war boom imposed a heavy burden on the working class. Structural changes required a high degree of labor mobility, uprooting workers and destroying their communities. Technological changes demanded a high degree of adaptability on the part of the workers and imposed a progressive intensification of labor to meet competitive pressure by putting expensive machinery to the fullest use. The working class as a whole was reconciled to such pressures by the generalization of the collaborative system of industrial relations on the basis of a generalized expectation
of a rising standard of living and by the extension and rationalization of the welfare apparatus, largely completing the socialization of the reproduction of the working class through a combination of private and public social insurance, the extension of public housing, education and health care, and a more or less comprehensive system of social security. As Beveridge had anticipated, the socialization of consumption was the liberal alternative to the socialization of production as the means of securing the social and political integration of the working class into the capitalist order. The development of the system of industrial relations and the institutionalization of an expectation of regular wage increases did not spont occur spontaneously but was actively encouraged by the state building on the U.S. example of the Roosevelt era, which was extended to Europe and Japan by the occupying powers as the centerpiece of the international phase of Reconstruction. Rising wages within a stable industrial relations framework were seen as the basis of the political stabilization of the liberal state form and simultaneously as the means of overcoming the barriers to accumulation presented by the limited mass market that had impeded recovery and precipitated the crash after the First World War. In Britain, the institutionalization of industrial relations in the new industries was extended in the war and post-war reconstruction period to all branches of production, initially as the means of reconciling the working class to austerity against the promise of better times ahead that arrived once the immediate barriers to accumulation were overcome. Wage determination had little to do with the classical model of supply and demand. The rapid growth in employment eased the high degree of labor mobility required by the uneven development of the various branches of production. Employment growing rapidly in the service sector, where productivity grew slowly and in man managerial and technical and administrative occupations associated with the monopolization of industry, the growth of public services, and the separation of mental and manual labor that marked the new methods of production, while manual employment in manufacturing industry grew little or even fell after the reconstruction period as new methods of production dispensed with living labor. Changing wage differentials played a minor role in allocating labor. Displaced rural workers, married women workers, and rising numbers of immigrants from the end of the 1950s provided an ample supply of labor to match the growing demand in low-wage occupations, while the post-war expansion of the public education system provided a growing supply of white-collar and technical workers. Thus, occupational and industrial differentials were largely embedded in established and fiercely defended social norms. Differentials were remarkably stable considering the enormous structural changes in employment in the course of the boom. Trade unionism was relevant primarily in the defense of wage differentials. The general level of real wages was not determined through pay bargaining, but by the relationship between the rise in money wages and the rate of inflation. Although the pace was set by manufacturing industry, the expectation of rising wages soon became embodied in a steadily rising consumption norm that extended to all branches of production, reinforced by the attempt to trade unions of trade unions to maintain differentials. The expectation of regular pay increases stimulated a rise in trade union membership within an, an industrial relations framework with an emphasis on na national bargaining to set the norm for the annual pay around supplemented by company and plant bargaining to take account of local circumstances. Reconstruction and the Korean War boom provided the inflationary environment in which such a system of wage determination could become established in the annual pay round, though which, through which trade, union nego trade unions negotiated pay increases to maintain or increase real wages in the face of inflation. Continued inflation made it possible to accommodate rising real wages without requiring cuts in prices and in money wages, which had in the past been a potent source of industrial conflict, to accommodate the uneven development of the forces of production in various branches of production. The employers in slowly growing branches of production correspond to an increase in money wages,
that threaten to erode profits by raising their prices while increasing money wages and the expansion of credit to meet the rising costs of production expanded the domestic market so that capitalists were able to realize their expanded capital at the increased prices. The post-war boom took off on the basis of relatively low wage rates, a legacy of the destruction or containment of the organized working class over the previous two decades, the stabilization of currencies and of payments imbalances through exchange rate adjustments and direct controls in the reconstruction period and after the reconstruction and Korean War boom, falling prices of food and raw materials. In such favorable circumstances, the early stages of the boom saw a further rise in the rate of profit in most of the metropolitan centers of accumulation. Higher profits stimulated more rapid accumulation, while the rapid growth of employment increased the bargaining strength of the workers. The result was that during the 1950s, the rate of increase of real wages became, became institutionalized in a rising consumption norm that differed from one country to another, relating primarily to the rate of growth of productivity, the terms of international trade, and the normal rate of profit, while having little to do with the strength of the organized labor movement. Indeed, the relationship was, if anything, the reverse the most prosperous capitalists being able to defeat militant trade unionism and install collaborative industrial relations systems by offering relatively generous pay increases while weaker capitals had less space in which to establish such accommodative labor relations. Rapid accumulation, improving terms of trade, and reductions in military expenditure provided metropolitan governments with the latitude within which metropolitan governments could respond to the social aspirations of the working class and confine working class political activity within constitutional channels by increasing welfare expenditure and raising public sector wages. Welfare benefits and the provision of public services tended to increase in line with the rate of growth of real wages as rising incomes generated growing tax revenues. Working class expectations were constantly encouraged by national governments, which increasingly made rising wages and more generous welfare benefits and public services the basis of their appeal to the electorate and the, in and the measure of the success of their policies. The considerable increase in public expenditure, financed primarily by direct taxation and insurance contributions and the institutionalization of the rising expectations of the working class through the system of industrial relations and electoral politics meant that the fiscal, financial, and political pressure on the state to ensure the sustained accumulation of capital were much stronger than they had been in the pre-war era. It was these pressures that were expressed in the Keynesian commitment to full employment. The precise institutional forms of the Keynesian welfare state, and particularly the relative weight given to the Keynesian welfare state's different elements, differed from one country to another, depending primarily on the political context in which those policies or institutional forms were introduced. There is not the space to explore such differences here. However, it is striking that the political strength of the organized working class tended to be correlated positively with the extent of socialization of consumption and with state intervention focused on the regulation of labor, and negatively with the extent of the socialization of production, and with the state intervention focused on the regulation of investment, which would tend to confirm the argument developed above that the strength of the organized working class restricts the direct intervention of the state in production by presenting a barrier to the attempt of the state to restructure production on the basis of capital. This would imply that Keynesian welfareism and corporatism are by no means complementary, as many have argued, but are divergent strategies, are divergent strategies, corresponding to a very different balance of class forces. Keynesianism offered precisely the, quote, middle way between monetary orthodoxy and corporatism.
The differences between the various national forces of institutionalized class collaboration appeared to be dissolved as the boom reached its height in the late 1960s. However, they became extremely important in determining diverging patterns in the face of the breakdown of Keynesian integration to such an extent that in retrospect, doubts were raised as to whether there had ever been such a thing as the Keynesian welfare state. Nevertheless, what they all had in common was the increasing systematic and pervasive involvement of the state, directly and indirectly, in the regulation of the reproduction of the working class through the wage, social insurance, and social security, on the basis of a generalized expectation of rising wages, a guaranteed minimum subsistence, and a political commitment to full employment. Keynesianism and the Boom Keynesianism offered a state ideology entirely appropriate to the conditions of the post-war boom. The commitment to full employment was not simply a concession to the aspirations of the working class, but also expressed the actuarial constraints embodied in the welfare state and contributed to the confidence of capitalists that accumulation would be sustained by sub expansionary policies. More fundamentally, Keynesianism expressed the belief that rising wages and public expenditure would resolve the contradictions inherent in capital accumulation. On the one hand, the growth of the mass market would banish the problem of overproduction that had underlain crises, depressions, and wars. On the other hand, rising wages, welfare benefits, and public services would reconcile the working class to its subordination to the wage form while providing the healthy, educated, and contented labor force required to sustain accumulation. For Keynesians, the state could overcome the cyclical alternative. For Keynesians, the state could overcome the cyclical alternation of inflation and unemployment through an active budgetary policy, ensuring that demand grew sufficiently rapidly to maintain full employment without spilling over into inflation, while an accommodating monetary policy ensured that investment would not be discouraged by high interest rates or a shortage of funds. Keynes had proposed that stabilization policy should focus on investment through public works programs in periods of unemployment. However, such a form of regulation was not appropriate to the kind of fine-tuning envisaged by post-war Keynesians since investment programs had a long planning horizon. Moreover, political considerations favored tax reductions and increases in current expenditure as means of stimulating the economy since these had an immediate and obvious impact on the electorate. And the other, on the other hand, similar considerations favored the postponement or cancellation of public investment and restrictive monetary policy as the means of containing inflationary pressures. Keynesians did not believe that there was any conflict between their objective of full employment and the orthodox objectives of price and monetary stability, primarily because of their exaggerated faith in the allocative efficiency of the market. Whereas classical economists had been un seen unemployment as a symptom of the misallocation of resources to be remedied only by the restructuring of prices and production within a framework of sound money, Keynesians saw unemployment as a symptom of a deficiency of demand to be remedied by an, an injection of spending. Classical economists saw Keynesian remedies as inflationary, as the expansion of demand to absorb unemployment in the overexpanded branches of production led to rising prices of produ products in short supply, inhibiting the restructuring of relative prices and production by sustaining backward producers and undermining the regulatory role of the market, only serving to postpone and intensify the inevitable crisis. Keynesians, by contrast, saw classical remedies as deflationary, carrying the danger of cumulative decline. The fear of a deflationary spiral and the belief that a modest degree of inflation would ease microeconomic adjustments gave Keynesians a mild inflationary bias, but Keynesians were confident that demand management policies would reconcile full employment with price stability. Keynes himself had been well aware of the dangers of inflationism 
although he was confident that sound government would not succumb to the temptation. Cain's greater fear was that international constraints would force a reversal of expansionary policies as they led to a temporary surge in imports and diversion of exports to the home market before domestic producers had an opportunity to respond to the stimulus of increasing demand. Thus, the key to the pursuit of Keynesian domestic policies was the development of international monetary institutions which could finance the transition imbalances of international payments that would arise as a result of the temporary misallocation of domestic resources. Keynes had played the leading role in the construction of such institutions, which sought to overcome the deficiencies of the interwar gold standard, which supposedly lay in the shortage of liquidity and the rigidity of exchange rates by expanding international liquidity and providing for exchange rate adjustments policed by the IMF to compensate for differential rates of domestic inflation. Thus, the pursuit of domestic Keynesian policies depended in its turn on the ability of the international institutions to pursue Keynesian policies on a global scale. The regulation of accumulation on a world scale, rising wages, and the growth of consumer credit provided a growing domestic market to absorb the product of manufacturing industry. Monopolistic pricing policies, initially reinforced by tariff barriers tariff barriers and the cost of transport, limited domestic price competition so that competition was primarily on the basis of product specification and advertising, leading to a steady rise in unproductive advertising and research and development expenditure, while the devaluation of capital in the face of rapid technical change was an anticipated was anticipated in high rates of depreciation of capital goods. However, accumulation was not confined within the limits of the market. If domestic accumulation was to be sustained, advanced capitals had to overcome the barrier to the limited domestic market by expanding the market on a world scale. In the early stages of the post-war boom, advanced capitals were able to use their high domestic profits as a launching pad from which to conquer world markets. However, tariffs, exchange controls, and transport costs at first presented barriers to the penetration of overseas markets. These barriers were overcome by the internationalization of productive capital, as U.S. companies sought out the cheap labor in booming markets of Europe, while European companies began to seek access to the most advanced technology available in the United States. The growing international integration of accumulation underlay the liberalization of international trade and payments through the 1950s, while the reduction of the cost of shipping and road transport further reduced the barriers to international trade. The liberalization of world trade was to some extent based on an international division of labor between the various branches of production, with, for example, Scandinavia, the Dominions, and North America exporting temperate foodstuffs, the U.S. advanced means of production, aircraft and military equipment, Germany, automobiles, scientific equipment and machine tools, Italy, consumer durables, Japan, steel, ships and textiles, and the third world agricultural products and minerals, accumulation on a world scale based on such comparative advantages, established a virtuous circle for the more advanced producers, the growing market and booming profits, provided the stimulus to increased investment, which further increased productivity and comparative advantage, while the corresponding overproduction of commodities put weaker producers under increasing competitive pressure. Moreover, where a leading branch of domestic production could command the world market, the stimulus communicated itself to other branches of production as a growing domestic market stimulated investment and the adoption of more advanced production methods so that a technological lead established in a dominant branch of production was soon communicated to other branches. Thus, the domestic integration of accumulation on the basis of growing, a growing mass market considerably reduced the unevenness of development of the branches of production on a domestic scale. However, the same forces increased the unevenness of development
on a world scale. So that international trade acquired an increasingly competitive dimension. The unevenness appearing in growing trade imbalances once post-war controls were dismantled. As the global overaccumulation of capital led to the uneven development of accumulation on a world scale, imbalances in international payments were accommodated within the gold exchange standard by the growth of international liquidity fed by the British and above all the U.S. balance of payments deficits, on which a pyramid of international credit was built from the late 1950s. The growth of trade and the growth of U.S. overseas investment and military expenditure eased the dollar shortage and permitted the restoration of the convertibility of the leading currencies. The internationalization of money capital proceeded far more rapidly than did the growth of official reserves and IMF quotas. While the rapid increase in international liquidity made it possible to finance growing trade imbalances and so sustaining accumulation on a world scale, the internationalization of money capital increased the risk of currency speculation. The stability of the international monetary system could only be secured by the parallel expansion of the International Monetary Fund and the official reserves through gold pooling, currency swaps, and the creation of international credit money in the form of EPU units and later the IMF's special drawing rights and the mobilization of reserves through central bank cooperation. Thus the management of world money was kept under a precarious international political control through the 1950s and 1960s. International monetary institutions and the cooperating central banks did not have the power of the nation state over the circulation of the currency and so did not have any direct control over the expansion of international credit that accommodated growing international payments imbalances. However, they were able to use their power as lender of last resort to make balance of payments finance and stabilization loans conditional on national government's correct payments imbalances, correcting, in pay, correcting payments imbalances by containing domestic inflation, and so provided some check on the unrestrained growth of international credit. To this extent, the international monetary institutions constituted the nucleus of a world state by providing a framework within which the power of world money could be imposed on recalcitrant national governments and their unstable currencies. Although the power of money was mobilized by foreign bankers, the exercise of such power did not express the subordination of the nation, either to foreigners or to bankers, as the populist critics claimed, but rather the subordination of domestic accumulation and the policies of national governments to the accumulation of capital on a world scale, expressed in the subordination of national currencies to world money and in the commitment expressed in the GATT, G -A -T -T, and embodied in the articles of the IMF to repudiate discriminatory trading practices. On the other hand, the power of the dollar limited the leverage of the international institutions and cooperating central banks over the U.S. authorities, who appeared able to run payment deficits with impunity. The regulation of accumulation on a global scale was thus constantly threatened by the U.S. inflationism that had worried Keynes in 1923 as the internationalization of money capital, fueled by the growing U.S. deficit, expanded international liquidity and stimulated inflationary overaccumulation on a global scale. It appeared that Keynesianism had provided the means of overcoming the barriers to domestic expansionism only by producing a recipe for global inflation. The Limits of Liberal Keynesianism The planning mechanism of the Reconstruction period, exchange rate adjustments and international capital flows had established the conditions under which the international system of trade and payments could be liberalized without payment imbalances immediately undermining the domestic commitment to full employment. During the late 1950s, the rapid growth of productivity
improving terms of trade and reductions in military expenditure made it possible for capitalists to absorb money wage increases and the state to absorb increases in expenditure so that high levels of employment were consistent with price stability. In terms of economic policy, Keynesian objectives are broadly consistent with orthodox objectives, so the theoretical basis of fiscal and monetary policy had little practical significance. Keynesian policies played little active role in promoting the boom. The main problem was inflation, rather than the threat of unemployment, as accumulation in the leading branches of production ran ahead of the supply of labor power and means of production. Governments increasingly determined their fiscal stance in accordance with the Keynesian principle of the, quote, inflationary gap, running surpluses to absorb inflationary pressure rather than following the orthodox prescription of balancing the budget and relying exclusively on restrictive monetary policies to contain inflation. This was not simply because they had been converted to Keynesianism, but that was also, excuse me, governments increasingly determined their fiscal stance in accordance with the Keynesian principle of the, quote, inflationary gap, running surpluses to absorb inflationary pressure, rather than following the orthodox prescription of balancing the budget and relying exclusively on restrictive monetary policies to contain inflation. This is not simply because they had been converted to Keynesianism, but was also for technical reasons, monetary policy proving ineffective in the face of excess liquidity in the financial system and the booming profits of the corporate sector. Although Keynesianism was soon adopted as the legitimating ideology of the state, as governments took credit for the boom, the substantive issue that divided Keynesian from classical economists did not come to a head until the emergence of barriers to accumulation confronted governments with the dilemma of choosing between full employment and price stability. It was not long before the overaccumulation of capital on a world scale came up against the barrier of the limited market, leading to growing competition, which averted the super profits of the more advanced producers and put the weaker capitals under increasing pressure. The institutionalization of trade unionism within a system of industrial relations, had accommodated the working class to its subordination to the wage form. However, the system of industrial relations institutionalized the expectation of regular increases in wages and provided constitutional channels through which the working class could seek to realize its aspirations, while the low rates of unemployment strengthened the hand of the trade unions. Thus, hard-pressed capitals could not force down wages and intensify labor unilaterally without facing costly and damaging strikes. The state similarly tended to hold back from encouraging aggressive employers for fear of the destabilizing political impact of such class confrontations. In such circumstances, the only means of sustaining profits in the face of growing competition and rising wages was by transforming methods of production. The transformation of methods of production in the face of growing competition further intensified the global overaccumulation of capital, putting the weaker capitals under even greater competitive pressure. The displacement of labor by the more advanced producers and the liquidation of weaker capitals tended to increase unemployment. In such circumstances, Keynesian objectives implied an expansionary response, reducing interest rates and increasing demand to boost employment wages and profits by absorbing excess capacity and stimulating new investment. Keynesians recognize that the immediate impact of expansionary policies would be to raise prices and to weaken the balance of payments. However, expansionary policies provided a more favorable environment in which productive capitals could introduce more advanced methods of production by expanding the domestic market to relieve the pressure on profits and providing the capital required to finance new investment. If capitalists responded to such incentives increased if capitalists responded to such incentives, increased productivity would enable capitalists to absorb the wage increases required to compensate for higher prices so that inflationary pressure could be relieved and would enable them to face the competitive challenge 
relieving the pressure on the balance of payments. Thus, prices, pri thus price increases would be temporary, and transitional payments imbalances could be accommodated by international credit. The limits of Keynesianism appeared when capitalists failed to respond appropriately to the opportunities presented to them. Expansionary policies did not in themselves provide any means of ensuring such a response. On the contrary, in relieving the pressure on backward capitals, they reduced the pressure of achieve, to achieve such a restructuring as inflation eased the pressure on profits by eroding real wages and by devaluing money capital in the benefit to the benefit of productive capital, and as cheap credit relieved the pressure on liquidity. In such circumstances, inflation threatened to become cumulative as money wages rose to compensate for price increases, leading to a further deterioration in international competitiveness and a weakening balance of payments. The impact of Keynesian policies depended on the response of capitalists. This response was not simply a matter of the subjective inclinations of capitalists, but primarily of the domestic conditions of accumulation in the context of the uneven development of capital on a world scale. The more advanced capitals were able to take advantage of profits inflated by expansionary domestic policies to increase their productive capacity by absorbing weaker capitals, investing in new plant, and adopting more advanced methods of production. High domestic profits facilitated the penetration of world markets and the payment of higher wages to reconcile the workforce to the intensification of labor and the restructuring of production and employment. On the other hand, weaker capitals had limited scope for expanding efforts in the face of stiff foreign competition, and so had little incentive to expand capacity by investing in new plant, while low profits in a stagnant market made it difficult for even the more ambitious to secure industrial finance and provided little scope for paying higher wages. In such cases, mergers and takeovers were designed more to consolidate a domestic monopoly than to pave the way for increased investment. The result was that Keynesian policies tended to intensify the overaccumulation and uneven development of capital by sustaining backward capitals while stimulating renewed accumulation on the part of the more advanced. Keynesian policies were pursued at the level of the nation-state. The ability of the nation-state to pursue full employment policies was, cons was constrained by the relative competitive strength of domestic productive capital in the face of the overaccumulation of capital on a world scale. Where capital in the leading branches of production commanded world markets, Keynesian full employment policies could sustain a virtuous circle of rapid accumulation and rising living standards. Rising exports provided the means to pay for imports required to meet the growing demand for the means of production and subsistence stimulated by the more rapid pace of accumulation. The rapid growth of productivity relieved inflationary pressure, while booming investment and exports provided jobs for workers displaced by the liquidation of backward capitals and the adoption of more advanced methods of production. Healthy profits and rising state revenues provided the means to pay higher wages, relatively generous redundancy payments, and unemployment benefits, to expand employment and public services, and to develop ambitious training programs, reducing trade union resistance to the intensification of labor, and the restructuring of production and unemployment. However, it was not Keynesian policies that sustained accumulation in such circumstances, but rather what sustained such accumulation in such circumstances. However, it was not Keynesian policies that sustained accumulation in such circumstances, but rather it was sustained accumulation that permitted the pursuit of Keynesian policies, the primary function of which was not to maintain full expenditure, but to contain inflation. In the less advanced centers of accumulation, Keynesian expansionary policies maintained full employment by sustaining backward producers at the cost of raising infl rising inflation and a, and a deteriorating balance of payments. Rising inflation increased the pressure for foreign competition, 
Rising inflation increased the pressure of foreign competition, which extended to the more advanced domestic capitals. The erosion of real wages by inflation stimulated higher wage demands, which met with growing resistance from employers. The devaluation of money capital and rentier incomes increased the political pressures on the government to contain inflation, while the deterioration in ba the balance of payments, reinforced by an outflow of surplus capital, precipitated speculation against the currency. In the face of rising inflation and growing pressure on the balance of payments, governments were forced to adopt deflationary policies to restore confidence in the stability of the currency. Deflation brought accumulation back within the limits of the market. Increased competition, higher interest rates, and reduced capacity working increased the pressure on profitability, reducing ability, the ability of capitalists to raise prices, and stiffened the resistance to demands for higher wages. However, while restrictive policies contained inflation, Restrictive policies led to rising unemployment, growing industrial conflict, and electoral dissatisfaction with rising levels of taxation and cuts in public expenditure, which made it increasingly difficult for governments to persist with such policies, particularly if an election was approaching. Thus, deflationary policies would be reversed and expansionary policies reintroduced under the banner of Keynes, to combat unemployment and raise living standards by boosting demand. At first, the absorption of surplus capacity and surplus labor could make it possible for wages, profits, and public expenditure to rise together. However, sooner or later, inflation would rise, the balance of payments deteriorate, and the cycle would begin again. The limits of Keynesianism appeared as the rapid growth of the world market, stimulated by the expansion of credit, gave free rein to the overaccumulation of capital. While Keynesianism increased the armory of the government in regulating the pace of domestic accumulation by adding fiscal to monetary instrument, instruments, Keynesianism did not provide any alternative means to secure the restructuring of capital in the face of a crisis of overaccumulation than the classical deflationary mechanism. When it was put to the test, Keynesian demand management proved to be nothing more than old-fashioned inflationism. The limits of liberal Keynesianism did not appear to the state immediately as such, but in the form of the barriers of inflation and the balance of payments, which forced the government to reverse expansionist policies. Such barriers were no surprise to orthodox economists, for whom inflation was the necessary result of the Keynesian attempt to override the operation of the market under the rule of money, balance of payment crises having the entirely positive role of limiting Keynesian profligacy. Right-wing Keynesians continued to press for the subordination of macroeconomic regulation to the primary constraint of price stability, legitimating the right-wing Keynesians' arguments by developing the concept of, quote, overfull employment in which trade unions were able to take advantage of labor shortages to raise money wages more rapidly than was justified by productivity increases, and various statistical exercises were carried out to establish the level of unemployment consistent with price stability. However, the issue is not a matter of economic analysis, but of political imperatives. Keynesianism was not simply an economic theory. Keynesianism had become the ideological expression of institutionalized forms of regulation of capitalist reproduction, which embodied working class expectations of rising wages, increasing standards of public provision, and the employment and employment opportunities, and which could not simply be discarded at will. Thus, the failure of Keynesian policies did not immediately lead to the abandonment of Keynesianism, but to the extension of state intervention within the liberal framework of the Keynesian welfare state. As governments sought to remove the barriers to sustained accumulation and to reconcile full employment, rising wages and price stability in the attempt to preserve the Keynesian framework of class collaboration. On a global scale, the barrier to sustained accumulation appeared as the limited supply of official reserves with which to support national currencies
in the face of speculative movements of private capital, Keynesianism remedies, Keynesian remedies, therefore, centered on the expansion of such reserves and the development of new forms of official credit. Although the rapid internationalization of capital gave all nation states an interest in sustaining accumulation on a world scale, such remedies had limited prospects of success because those remedies merely increased the scope for global inflationism. Thus, the growth of official funds continued to lag behind the internationalization of money capital, and the primary source of balance of payments, finance, remained private capital markets, whose stabilization depended increasingly on ad hoc cooperation between the central banks. The resulting vulnerability of the weaker currencies to speculation focused interventionist attention more firmly on the problems of the international competitiveness of domestic productive capital. At the national level, the problem appeared at first as that of the relation between wage increases and the growth of productivity.